So I was really excited about this year's conference because it's He Loves Me, right? And so how many of you actually used to grab a daisy and say, He loves me. He loves me not. You know, I know with my um, husband, Brian, we probably could have gone through this whole daisy with he loves me, he loves me not. We dated for many, many, many years, and we were on again, off again, because he loves me, he loves me not. But you know, through this whole time, we really saw that God was actually working in our lives and working as us as a couple. One time we were actually at a bar slash pub watching our ice hockey team, and um, I went with my girlfriends probably like some 10, 15 miles away so that I didn't have to run into anybody I knew. So in the middle of the game, I look at the, at the door and there's Brian. I'm like, he's following me. <laughs> he says he loves me not, he's, he's following me. So I went over and I said, what are you doing here? He goes, what are you doing here? I went 15 miles away so I didn't have to see you. I was like, oh, here we are again. So, you know, I think um, through that whole thing of being loves me, he loves me not, I just wanted to be chosen. I just wanted to be his special one. I wanted, I guess I wanted the fairy tale. I wanted to be the one that he said, yes, by a shadow of a doubt, you're it. You're the one I've chosen. So today we're actually gonna look at a story about um, Leah and how she probably felt the same way. She wanted to be the chosen one. Let me give you a little bit of background about uh, the story. Um, Rebecca and Isaac had um, twin boys. Esau and Jacob. And um, when they came out of the room, Esau came first. But Jacob was actually holding on to his ankle. He wanted to be the firstborn. He wanted that birthright. So he was hanging on to everything he had to get out of the womb first. But it didn't happen. So sadly, him and his mom devised a plan and deceived his dad in order to get the firstborn birthright. Well, you can imagine how Esau felt about this. He wasn't a very happy camper. In fact, so much that um, Jacob fled, fled to his homeland to get out of there from Esau, so he, didn't, um, he wasn't killed. So his mom said, why don't you go to the um, land of my brother? So here's where we pick up the story in Genesis 29, verses 16 through 35. Now Labam had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was, had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. How come they didn't mention her eyes? Anyway, he didn't see that at the point, I guess. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel. But they seemed only like a few days to him because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is complete. I want to make love to her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a, huge, gave a feast. And when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob. And Jacob made love to her. And Laban gave his servant Zilpah to his daughter as an attendant. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said, what is this that you have done for me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Kind of funny. Then Laban replied, it is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant Bilhah to his daughter and as her attendant. Jacob made love to Rachel also, and his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah, and worked for Laban another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. So can you imagine what this last seven years was, or the first seven years was like? Think of it from Laban's point of view. I have two daughters. The oldest one should be married first. So he said, you've 
Seven years is a long time. Surely a suitor's gonna come along for Leah too. I know I promised Rachel, but somebody's gotta come along and fall in love with Leah and, or me choose someone for Leah. It's gotta happen. And you know, Leah's in the background going, I have seven years. Surely I can find love in seven years. But as Jacob said, it went like that. You know, the next thing they know, it's time for him to marry Rachel. And Laban's sitting there and Leah's sitting there going, it hasn't happened. Now what are we gonna do? So Laban says, all right, I have a plan. Let's deceive Jacob and you can marry, well, I'll give him Leah, and then, but I'll also give him Rachel. So all three of them, including Rachel, probably had to be in on the plan. And so, but you can imagine, Leah's just like, but I wanted my own husband. I wanted to be chosen. I wanted to love. I wanted to be loved. But you know, it's really not about what Leah wants. We're looking at how God loves us. And how did God love Leah through this whole situation? So I think God's, well, it says here, she named her son, God saw my misery. So God actually saw Leah through this time, through this whole seven years of wanting, and he saw that, and he also saw that Jacob didn't love her. So, but you know what? He still blessed her. And I was wondering if there's times in our lives that we have blessings that we didn't ask for, that he sees how miserable we are, or he sees how unhappy we are, and yet he still blesses us despite. Um, about a year and a half ago or so, we were um, on our last year of our work visa. I've been, we'd been here nine years and our work visa was for 10 years. And so we were on our last year and we had to make a decision whether we wanted to go home to back to the States or we wanted to stay here or what we wanted to do. And Brian still wasn't able to find full-time employment over here. So we said, okay, let's push the door to move back to America. We don't know what that looks like. We don't know you know, where we're gonna go, where we're gonna land, but I think that's maybe where we're, we're headed. And so um, at church that next Sunday, someone asked me, so what about Brian? How's, how's he doing with the job opportunities? And I was like, there's nothing. And she goes, well, can I pray for you? I was like, yeah, sure, you know, it'd be great. We'd love to know God's will. We'd love to have someone speak into our lives. And so we actually just um, held out our hands and she prayed and she said, God, I really pray that you would show them this week what you want to happen. And I, of course, am like, yes, 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 oh. But what she doesn't know is that my boss is on vacation, I'm on vacation, you know, nothing's gonna happen for at least three weeks. There's gonna be no answers for at least three weeks. That was bold of her, yeah, thanks God. So, of course, Monday came along, Tuesday came along, Wednesday came along, Thursday came along, I was doing my quiet time. And I was like, see God, I told you. It's Thursday, nothing's gonna happen this week. I was really bold of her and I really appreciate her bold prayers, but that's not gonna happen. So on Friday morning, we take the kids to school and we're sitting there having coffee that morning and the phone rings. And we look at each other, I mean the landline rings. So we look at each other and go, who could be calling us on a Friday at 9.30 in the morning? So Brian answers the phone and he goes, well, yes, well, I don't know, I've moved on. I don't know, let me ask my wife. And so he puts it on hold and he goes, you know the job I applied for in January that I didn't get, that I came in second? And I said, yeah. He goes, they wanna know if I want to interview for the job again. He goes, the other guy backed out and they want me. And I was just like, not this week. No, no, not this week. Why couldn't it be next week? Because you know what, I had one foot on the other side of the pond. I wanted to go back to America. My whole cry was, Lord, take me back. I want to go home. And not that I could actually go home, but I did want to be closer to family. And so I didn't really want this, just as Leah didn't want a son. She wanted God to love her. I didn't want Brian to get a job. I wanted to go home. But you know what? Before I even knew what I wanted, God gave Brian a job. And the same way, he gave Leah a son. So sometimes he knows before we do, but sometimes he knows better than we do. Because if we look at the next verse, it says, she conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard 
that I am not loved. He gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Simeon means to hear. So not that it specifically says that Leah was crying out, but you know that all of her prayers must have been, Lord, please make him love me. Why doesn't he love me? Why can't I go home? Why can't I be near family? Life would be easier if I just had family here. But you know what? He didn't. He didn't answer the way I wanted him to. He didn't answer Leah. He answered better. He gave her another son. You know, good on Leah. She's still seeing God in the picture at this point. She sees that God sees and she sees that God hears. So I know that God is hearing my cries for this. So we say, okay, God, you have us here. You have us in England. Let's apply for permanent residency and let's apply for citizenship so that we can actually get some of the benefits of living here. Because at this point, we don't have any benefits of living here. And so um, we started doing the a permanent leave to remain application. And um, the company that my, um, or the company, the company that my company hired to do the application had me fill out a little form. And one of the questions on this form was, do you receive any benefits? Of course, I don't really know what benefits is all about here in the UK. I mean, just, I don't, I don't know what you can and can't receive because we're not supposed to receive anything. But when the children were born, I filled out the application to receive the child benefit. Obviously, I should have known that. But they said, some immigrants get it and some don't. So I filled out the application and sent it in and thought, well, I'll let the HMRC decide whether we get this or whether we don't. And so we got it. So we were like, yes, so that makes life so much easier. So then when we had Jasmine two years later, we applied again. And I thought, they're going to catch us this time. They're going to realize they made a mistake on the first one. But they didn't. We got it again. So I was like, whew, that really makes it a lot easier since I'm the only one working and Brian's just doing part-time employment. So, but now, 10 years on, the HMRCs or the guy saying, you don't get it. So in order to get the leave to remain, you must pay back the full entire balance. And so I, of course, was thinking, well, we won't be able to afford that. Yes, we're going home. <laughs> you know, maybe this is the answer. We can't stay here permanently. This is the answer. So as... I got the letter from the HMRC, and this says, oh, thank you so much, Mrs. Hal, for return, agreeing to pay back the 10,256 pounds and 53 pence. Not that I keep track of the dollar amount or anything, but <laughs> I was just like, I just cannot believe this. We can't afford this. We can't, we ha we'll have to go back. So there's a whole process that you go through. You can dispute it, and so you dispute it, and then you, you can send it to someone else, and so you can send it to someone else, and they looked into it again, and so the final outcome was said that you'd have to go through to a tribunal judge, and that he then can decide your case of whether you have to pay it back, whether it was their heir or my heir. And um, so, I mean, through this whole thing, it's, we had to apply for an extension to our visas, our work visas, and they said, maybe it'll be one more year. So we apply for the extension of the visas. We have to go in person in case they would happen to ask us about this benefit. And I'm still so nervous and I'm still so anxious because is this the answer? Is this when I get to go home? Are they going to say no? What if they do say no? What if they say yes? What if they do? do? And so it's this whole up and down process. He loves me. He loves me not. Who's listening? I'm crying out. What, what is God doing? And so... Um, but we both had to come to a place because we couldn't really prove one way or the other. I didn't keep a copy of my application. Once I filled out these applications, I threw them away after we got the money. Why would I need it? So we kept on pushing the process through. I'm just going to grab a drink real quick. And so I think that um, I was really anxious. And I didn't really know if God was here in my prayers or whether he wasn't. So when we went and got our extension to our visas, the lady's like, congratulations, you got another three years. And my son started crying. He's like, but I wanted to go to America. And I thought, you know what? Me too. I was hoping we wouldn't get approved and we'd have to go home too. 
but we're not, or this is, you know, we're continuing on for another year. We'll see how the HMRC stuff does. But all the while, we're crying out to God, God, what do we do? How do we do this? We can't pay back the money. But you know, as time went on, God spoke to us and throughout the whole thing, this is like, no, you can't prove your innocence. But you know what? You have to be okay with me. And so we, we looked at each other and said, yeah, you know what? We're okay with God. We're okay with him. We love him. He's good to us. He knows us. Even if we have to pay back the money, he has a way of doing it. We might not have a plan, but we know that he does. And so, but sometimes you kind of get this old selfish thing and you think, how can I do it? How am I going to do this? But just as Leah did. And so it says then, again she conceived and she gave birth to a son. Now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi, which means adhesion or to bond to. So she was still hoping to bond to her husband. But what I found interesting about this verse is not one time in this verse, after her third son, does she mention God. She's on her own agenda at this point. She's like, I'm going to do this, even though God knows better and has then blessed her again with another son. She still has her own agenda for this. So I was wondering, how do we interpret God's blessings in our way? How do we think that this is just me, this is how I'm looking at the answer? I was thinking this whole HMRC was the answer to go home. But God knew better. He gave us more than what we had asked for. And so on the fourth time, she conceived again. Can you imagine this? This is a woman who is vying for her husband's love. You know, we have the foreknowledge of knowing right now that uh, Rachel can't have children. It said that she is not able to conceive. And Leah is bearing now his fourth son. You know, she doesn't know that God has closed Rachel's womb at this point, but yet she still wants her own agenda. But the, this time she says, she conceived again and she gave birth to a son. She said, this time I will praise the Lord. So, his, we, so she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. You know what? This time she doesn't have her own agenda. She doesn't even mention Jacob and Jacob's love or wanting Jacob's love. She just wants to praise God. What, what do you think that looks like? Do you think she had a worship band up there, you know, being able to praise God? And not that we don't praise God when we're worshiping, but what does it look like on an everyday basis? You know, what does it look like um, while I'm sitting there waiting for the HMRC to decide? You know, but I really think it frees, being able to praise us, praise God, frees us up to honor him on an everyday basis. It frees us up to thank him for the things that we have. She named him Judah. This was her praise. She could see God now through this child, not in her own terms, but in terms of what God is doing in her life. And um, Simon Gilbo is a, a um, missionary in Burundi. And um, yeah, Burundi's going through some hard times now. And Simon um, sent out a blog the other day and he quotes one of his um, devotions from his book, Choose Life. And this, in this entry on May 23rd, it says, resignation or acceptance. And he wrote, will you choose resignation or acceptance? With resignation, you focus on your problems, completely lose sight of God and give up. And the door of hope slams firmly shut but with acceptance, you acknowledge your reality, you face up to your problems, and yet look above and beyond them to Jesus who is still on the throne. And with that attitude, I'd say the attitude of praise, the door of hope remains wide open to God's sovereign and creative plans and purposes. You know what? God has a purpose for every single one of us. He had a purpose for Leah. You know, unlike um, Abraham, Abraham, how about that? <laughs> Abraham and Sarah, they actually had a promise from God. 
They knew that they would have a son and their descendants would be as, as many as the stars and as the sand, of the sand in the sea. They knew God's promise for them, that they would bear a son. But you know, Leah didn't have that promise. She didn't know what her sons were gonna be all about. You know, we can look back and we can see Mary had a purpose. Mary knew she had a purpose in life. But Leah didn't. I don't. I don't see that on an everyday basis. But not this side of this side of heaven. On earth, she had no idea. But I'm sure in heaven now, she knows that Judah. Judah was in the line of King David, who's then in the line of Jesus. Her purpose was to have these 12 children and Judah specifically. But you know what? She didn't. So how do we live our everyday lives knowing that we might not ever know our purpose? I think it's easy for missionaries like Simon to know what his purpose is. Yes, it's a really difficult one to be out in Burundi ministering to these people. But we don't. Sitting in Cheltenham working our everyday jobs, what's my purpose? Why am I in England? Why am I here? You know, I don't know. I have amazing friends. My kids go to amazing school. They have an amazing education. My husband now has an amazing job that he loves, and you can see him being more fulfilled. But what about me? What's my purpose? But knowing God's promises, knowing that he has a purpose for every single one of us, how does that make me live my daily life? What can I do? We had some amazing, amazing um, prophecy over Jaden, our oldest son, who's now seven. They said, you know, before they knew it was a boy or girl because we didn't know, they said, you know, this, this child is going to be a man of God. And I, can, I treat him differently knowing that there's been prophecy over his life. I teach him probably differently than I do Jasmine because I know there's prophecy over his life. But what about my own? How do I go about my everyday tasks? How do I go about raising my children? How do I go about worshiping and praising God, knowing that I matter? I might not know the influence that I've had, the side of heaven, but you know, I've got to try. I've got to live for him on a daily basis and seek him and praise him and tell others about him on a daily basis because you know what? That might be my purpose. We have a higher plan than just to go about everyday life. So the HMRC story does have a very happy ending. Um, we went to the tribunal judge and we sat before him and he goes, hi, my name is judge, whatever. I really wish I could remember that. And he says, I decide on this cases. I read the facts that the HMRC has sent in. I read the facts that you guys have sent in. I see over here what you've done. I see the, this letter over here. And he goes, wait a minute. You've won. And Brian and I were like, okay. He goes, you won. Okay. He goes, you don't have to pay anything back. They can never come against you for this debt ever again. I was like, I cannot believe it. I was like, sir, but I remember what happened. And he goes, Mrs. Howell. And I was like, no, no, really, I want to tell you. You know, I remember now, I had the application, I see the little box. I was faithful. The other day I went through and filled it all out. I was faithful. I did it. And I said, it says there on page 43 of the exhibit, paragraph two, it says there's a little box right there that says, you know, some people might apply. I said, so I went ahead and applied just because it, maybe it was me. He goes, Mrs. Howell, stop. You won. Your honesty was never in question. And I was like, can I cry now? And he's like, yep, there's a box of tissues right over there. <laughs> but you know, I just, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe that it was all done and over with. And we, we, we got out of there and I was, going, I just want to tell the world, I just want to call Sue, call John, they're the ones that helped us, call mom, call, and he's like, Jaylene, just take a breath. I was like, no, I want to share, I want to tell everybody what he's done. And Brian goes, you know what I think? 
I think we just saw a picture of what it's going to be like in heaven. Someday we're going to sit in front of the ultimate judge. He's going to have our list there of everything that we've done wrong. And he's going to say, Mrs. Howell, you've been set free, debt cleared. Because of the blood of Jesus and set, because he died on the cross and took all of your sins away, your debts are free. And there's going to be me, I'm sure. But, but sir, let me, let me tell you. <laughs> He's like, your honesty isn't in question because of Jesus Christ. And so I could hardly wait to get out. I could hardly wait. Once we had that picture and we knew from God beyond a shadow of a doubt that this was going to happen, I could hardly wait to go out and tell people what God had done for us. I mean, I know I've shared it with many of you. I've shared it with some of you. And I've shared it at church. And I've shared it with friends. Because I can just hardly contain and I think that's what true worship is, is not can, having to hold back and not being able to contain the love of God. Because you know what? He loves us before we ever did anything, before we even asked. He saw the situation you're in. He sees maybe you're not happy in your marriage. Maybe your husband's not a Christian. Maybe you're miserable at your job. Maybe you don't like how overweight you are. He knows before you've even said anything. He sees you. He hears your prayers. He hears when you cry out to fix the situation. Help me, change me. He hears that. But you know what? He goes beyond that. He gives us more, bigger, better, beyond our wildest dreams and beyond our wild imaginations. He loves us that much. He loves us enough to give us a purpose in life. So you know what? I hope someday when you get these flowers and you think of how much God loves you, that you can say, he loves me. He loves me a lot. <laughs> he loves me. He loves me a lot. So let us pray.